the astrolabe. It was the worst flood the village had experienced since records began. The stream normally ran through it like a silver artery, festooned with drooping pale green willows, forming pools for sticklebacks and voles to congregate, peppered with the flashing electric blue diving of kingfishers. This joyful arena of ever-changing fantasy was just like the one of his boyhood. He'd fallen in love with it when house-hunting for a pied-à-terre. But now it had turned into this 50-metre-wide anaconda of brown snaking torment. Gardens had been swallowed whole. The stone-walled houses had water halfway up their midriffs, submerging ground floors and leaving the villagers, including him, temporarily stranded on upper floors. He had bought the two-up, two-down cottage in the village on a whim. He had an income that exceeded his wildest expectations. When he was still at art college, he'd sold a series of motion graphic animations of amusing fantasy characters having adventures in a funky spaceship. And he'd sold it to the biggest global streaming network of them all. Having conquered 164 countries, his colourful characters were better known than pop stars. Commercial spin-offs flourished. Royalties flooded in. His agent said he would never need to work again if he could manage to eke out a living on a few hundred thousand pounds a year. So why else did he buy the cottage? As anyone might guess, a village which represents a glorious, unbridled childhood of free expression of body and mind has huge symbolic value. It would be his inspirational hideaway where he could write, draw and generally create. He would be in constant contact with his child self. After all, the imagination of his child self had been responsible for the cartoon characters that had made him a rich 26-year-old in the first place. When he was eight years old, out one weekend with a net and jam jar catching fish in the stream, he saw a stone disc on the clay bed. Perhaps nine inches in diameter, it was sticky in the wet clay. When he picked it up, it proved heavy for its size. He washed some of the clay off and dropped it into his little rucksack and took it home to the garden shed, where he kept all his unusual finds. Feathers, bones, coloured glass, dead insects, stones... The following weekend saw him cleaning up his latest discoveries so he could present them with labels in his glass display case museum. The disc was more intriguing than he'd guessed when he first saw it. It was creamy white, very smooth and covered in scratches. His imagination saw it as being battered from voyages through space, a flying saucer which could carry micro-aliens on adventures. And this was the source of inspiration for his art school creations. When the waters had finally receded and he cleaned up downstairs, luckily the tiled floors had saved the house from extensive damage, he carried down everything he had to store in the spare bedroom. And this included the glass case with all his childhood finds. He brought it here from his London townhouse thinking there would be more catalysts for cartoon ideas among its trophies. He set the case on a table under the east window. The morning sun lit it up beautifully. The objects inside it were picked out in all their colours and shapes. It was then... For the first time, he realised that the scratches on the disc 
might not be random. They might be deliberate markings. How strange not to have noticed them before, even when he'd photographed the stone for his art college portfolio. He captured it again on his mobile phone and did an image search on the net. It was no small surprise when the nearest image proved to be an astrolabe some 5,000 years old. Recent work on a similar one in the British Museum had established its age because the configuration of the stars etched upon its surface showed a night sky judged to be from that time in Earth's history. However, his stone disc, though recognised in his search as most likely an astrolabe, under a magnifying zoom showed a different sky chart altogether. Perhaps it wasn't an astrolabe after all. Hmm. He pondered whether to hand it over to the authorities, but some inner desire to have and to keep made him desire against it. He began filing the new photo images of the stone in the folder where he'd archived his art school ones. Here he experienced a secondary seismic shock. The magnified images were not the same. Basic background features remained, but there was a definite left-right drift of some of the stars across the stone, with new ones having appeared on the left. This drift had occurred within the last 18 years. His fertile, sci-fi-tuned mind went into hyperdrive. How could this be? It suggested that his stone astrolabe was somehow recording a changing firmament and it was not planet Earth's. He picked it up for a first really detailed scrutiny in all the time he'd owned it. It was heavier than he expected, as he already knew. It had some sort of metallic content. The surface was eggshell smooth, and here was his third surprise. When he ran his fingers over it, the markings proved, in fact, not to be etched upon it at all. They were integral to it. So what did that mean? He could only think of one answer. The stone was a living instrument, a constant scanner of an alien sky. But what sky? Where? In the Earth's galaxy? Beyond? What had been in his possession for all these years? An artefact, proof of alien life, knowledge of which might precipitate an unprecedented shift in human consciousness. We are not alone. He could see the headlines in the papers. Again he was faced with the dilemma of handing it over. Logically, and even morally, could he do anything else? As a citizen of Earth, surely it was an obligation. He opened the east window and placed it on the windowsill. With the sun on it, it seemed to his imagination to be transformed from inert stone into a pulsing intelligence. <laughs> he went to make coffee. Then from the kitchen he heard a kind of breathy whisper, like the gushing of air from a released valve. He rushed back. It was no imagination this time. The astrolabe was vibrating on the wood sill. Coming close, he saw the chart of star configurations waxing and waning in intensity. Then he saw another demonstration of the sophisticated nature of the artefact. Each time it waned, it erased a chart. When it waxed, it displayed another. One was of the alien heavens, the other was the familiar sky above his head with the plough and Venus and the Milky Way. It was alternating between the two. Wishing to test its energy, he placed a hand on it. Immediately, how should he describe it? He went electrical as though he'd been bound in copper wire and a small current passed around him. 
he fizzed with pulsating micro-detonations. The astrolabe even shifted its position and seemed to settle in a more propitious alignment. Then he was transported to a different space and time, one which he could somehow sense but not actually register in totality. His forefinger was still touching the astrolabe. He looked up and there was the alien sky it was depicting. He looked down and chart shifted. The window sill reappeared. He looked up again and above the house, the Earth's sun shone. He had no idea how long he was immobile. Time itself felt as though it had fled. It could have been weeks. So abnormal were the circumstances. All the while, this back and forth imaging continued. When he woke, it was to the bizarre knowledge that he had been the essential link in the astrolabe's transmission of planet Earth's cosmic coordinates. He had been a biological dynamo feeding the astrolabe and powering it so that it could communicate. He removed his hand, aware that what was done was done. It could not be undone. Wherever the astrolabe had come from, its makers now knew exactly where Earth was, if they hadn't before, and that sentient creatures inhabited it. He realised he was not greatly patriotic as far as planet Earth is concerned, even as he was shaking with the extraordinary, even terrifying turn of events. His brain was also alive and frantic with jostling ideas for a new cartoon series. He sat down. Then a sudden intuition made him put on the TV news. Except, and he was not in the least surprised by it, there was no news. Only a caption replicated in various wordings on all terrestrial and streaming stations. Owing to unprecedented circumstances, this channel is off air. Normal service will be resumed as soon as possible. He looked across at the astrolabe. It was gently glowing and pulsing. He walked over to the window and stared up at the sky. He touched the astrolabe. Immediately, he saw a swarm of little silver flecks forming an ominous, scintillating corona around the sun and they were becoming larger second by second. He took his hand away. They disappeared. He touched again. And there they were again now close enough to show details of silvery fins and tails. He went outside and sat on a tree stump in the middle of the devastation caused by the flooding. The irony was that it was the deluging waters that had precipitated all this. He put his head in his hands. They were coming. The astrolabe had spoken. And that was the astrolabe. I hope it touched a tender nerve for you. There are a few other stories on this channel which focus on weird and wonderful artefacts. For example, you might start with the curse of the bracelet. If you prefer or would like to read as well as listen, please go to my website which is www.jacksanger.com and there you'll find novels, short stories, poetry and plays which you can download for free or make a donation. In the meantime, please subscribe and tell your friends. Share the links. It's all very helpful. So that's all for now. 
I'll be back soon. Go in peace. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.